Right, good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to be here. One moment as I get my act together as the projector can maybe be turned back on. There we go. Perfect. So, all right, so I'm here to talk about, about the state of the kernel in various ways. And in the time a lot of it's not possible to even begin to cover everything that's going on in the kernel world, of course, but I can at least try to make a start. I will start in the way I often do by talking about what we have done over the course of the last year. Since the beginning of November, we've had five releases that have come out at this point, starting with 4.3 through to 4.7, which came out in July. We can, of course, extend this list forward just a little bit to this coming Sunday, where, unless something goes wrong, we will see the release of 4.8. These are all major kernel releases. They all come out, you'll notice, in either 63 or 70 days, nine or 10 weeks. That's pretty much the way every kernel release happens anymore. In fact, you have to go back to about 3.8, I think, to find one that didn't come out in that sort of time frame. We have at least 12,000 change sets in every, every kernel release that comes out. Lots of changes that are happening. 4.8 will be a relatively big kernel at about 12 or about 13,300 probably by the time it's done. Still not the record though. The record was set with 3.15 at about 13,700. I don't think we'll beat it this time around either. If you look over the course of the entire year now, in the about 13 months since the 4.3 development cycle began, we've had about 4,000 developers contributing to the kernel over this period of time. And they've put in over 76,000 change sets in the course of 13 months. So the kernel remains a very big and very busy software development project, perhaps the biggest out there. And it's, it's hard to match a development rate like that. If we just look briefly at the number of developers that are participating in the process, you can see that there. We have a nice steady upward trending line. This line covers since 3.0, five years or so worth of data, but you can extend it back almost indefinitely and you get pretty much the same thing. We always have have a larger group of developers who contribute to the kernel. And that's really a result of, of the second line there, which is the number of brand new developers contributing to each kernel release. And there's an interesting dynamic here that I've never quite figured out. For every kernel release that we've ever put out in recent history, about 200 new developers have contributed to it. About 200 people we have never seen before have added changes to the kernel. And that has persisted through the shortening of the release cycle over the years and various other things. There's just something about having a kernel release that brings in about 200 new people. Some of these people contribute their one patch and then they've done what they wanted to do and they move on to whatever else they would rather do. Some of them stick around for much longer than that. Over the, over the last year of those 4,000 developers that we saw, just under 2,000 of them were contributing for the first time over the course of the last year. So we have quite a few people coming in. We have a community that is pretty dynamic in terms of bringing people into it, which is a good and important thing. That's what you want to see for the long-term health of your development community. Sometimes it seems like there's a, a, a kernel old guard that stays there forever, but in fact, we have a lot of people coming through. So with regard to the community and what we're doing, it's, the story is really, in a sense, kind of boring. It hasn't, I've been saying the same thing for quite a few years now. We're putting out releases. We have a lot of new people coming in. The process at this level looks pretty good. Um, there, there are problems at other levels, that some of which I will touch on. But at this level, everything seems to be functioning pretty well. So I'm going to talk about just a few things that we've been working on and are working on. As I said, there's, there's no hope of coming even close to, to touching on everything, even if I stood up here and talked all day. And you would be awfully tired of me if I did that. So I'm just going to hit a few topics I think are of interest, starting with the topic of security, because security tends to be on people's mind when we open up the newspaper and we see, you know, 500 million user attack accounts leaked out of Yahoo or stories of governmental surveillance or various other sorts of things. Security is a big problem, and the kernel is the, the base of the system. Is really the kind of the last bastion with regard to security. If the kernel doesn't hold up, then, then our users have lost. So we're in a very important position with regard to the security of our users. And we want to make sure that we aren't letting them down. So um, if we look at just how we are doing, I decided to sort of look up the, the CVE numbers, the, the known vulnerability numbers for the kernel for this year. 
and kind of ran out of space on the slide. This is only through, through September, mind you. The year is not yet done. And this is only the CVE numbers that actually say kernel on them. If you look in the CVE database, an awful lot of them simply say reserved because nobody has gotten around to saying what the vulnerability is about. So the actual number of vulnerabilities, I would guess, is probably about double this of known vulnerabilities, mind you, in the kernel. This is a pretty significant list of, of problems. This is a lot of vulnerabilities. This is not something that you want to see in, in your kernel that's supposed to be your last bastion of security. But we do at least have a way of dealing with, with security problems, right? We've got a fairly simple algorithm for, for dealing with this. Whenever a vulnerability is found, we run around in circles, we create a patch and fix it, put it out there, a distributor ship a fix to everybody, and everybody is set, right? Well, there's, there's some problems with, with this approach, starting with this whole idea of, of making a patch and sending it out. The problem with this is that there are, you can go ahead and you can make these patches, but what you're really playing is a game of whack-a-mole. Um, I don't know if whack-a-mole exists in this part of the world. The, the moles pop up through the holes and you bash them down with a hammer, and it feels really good to smash those moles down. You, You've really shown those moles who the boss is. But the interesting thing that happens is that the moles keep popping up. And there's more and more moles, and they come up faster and faster. And eventually, the moles always win. Fixing security problems is really a game of whack-a-mole, right? You're bashing on it, but there's always going to be more moles. You're never going to, to get rid of all of them. So that's one thing. But if we go back to our security algorithm here, there's another problem as well with this whole idea that distributors ship an update. Um, Greg over here the other day posted this thing. Yes, Greg, I'm taking your words in vain. He found a security bug. Actually, a Google researcher found a security bug in 3.10. And he put it into the 3.10 updates. But in fact, it never got shipped by the Nexus phones from Google until six months later when he poked, it, poked them and got it put in there. As Greg put it, that was a six-month window when anybody could have gotten root on your phone easily. All right, this is just one of many vulnerabilities. This is with the Google Nexus devices, which are fairly widely regarded as having the best story out there when it comes to updates for, for devices out there. Um, for the most part, especially in the mobile embedded world, the story is much worse than this. These fixes are not getting shipped out there. So this whole idea that distributors ship an update kind of worked in the days when all we were dealing with was well, this is installing a distribution on our desktop machines. It, is, it has really fallen down in the world that we live in now. So in thinking about this, um, a few years back, I wandered over to the Republic of San Marino, a weird little country buried in the middle of Italy out there, and was looking at their approach to security. Once upon a time, if you wanted security, you found the highest spot you could find. You built a, a big castle on it with lots of tall walls. And then you were pretty much safe from everything except maybe for James Bond climbing up the cliff and blowing everything up. But if, if you managed to avoid that, you were pretty well safe. So I was sort of standing there looking at it and thinking, this is a model of security that worked really well once upon a time before people could fly. Um, you know, now you would not try to secure a city or a country in this way, even though it worked fairly well for quite a while. Similarly, the defenses that we have, I believe, are really not sufficient for today's threats. And by the way, I'm certainly not the only one saying this. Constantine has a great talk about this kind of stuff. And um, others do as well. And what, what everybody has been saying for a while is that the whack-a-mole approach isn't working. That we have to, to adopt an approach that says that vulnerabilities are always going to be with us. They are a fact of life. Even if we could, say, stabilize a kernel and fix every single bug that's in it, in a world where we are adding 76,000 changes to the kernel over a course of a year, we're going to introduce bugs. We just, there's no way to avoid that. And we cannot avoid putting in all these changes if we want the project to live, to continue to go forward. So we need to think about something else. And what people have been saying for quite a few years is that we need to be focusing on eliminating classes of exploits instead. We need to get to a world where we know the vulnerabilities will exist, but we are resistant to the exploiting of those vulnerabilities when, when they do come about. So this has been a kind of a hard sell in the kernel community for various reasons. But uh, with luck, it's getting better. So if we look over the course of the last year or so, in 4.6, we got post-init read-only memory. 
when, you, when the kernel boots, it sets up a whole lot of data structures in memory and then never touches them again. If you make that stuff read only after you're done setting it up, then, then any kind of exploit that relies on changing the contents of that memory will now fail because it, is, it has been set read only. So we have that in 4.6. We're not using it much yet, but we'll get there. We finally are able to use the GCC plugin mechanism to use plugins to instrument the code, to add security features to the code. This just went in for 4.8. There aren't really any plugins that are being used yet, but I expect we will see that change as soon as the 4.9 development cycle. And we'll start seeing hardening of the kernel by way of GCC plugins. The Linux kernel stack is an interesting data structure. There's one that exists for every process in the system. It fits in typically four pages anymore. The interesting thing about the kernel stack is that there's no way to really know that there's no path through the kernel that will never overflow this kernel stack. And in fact, if you stack up lots of interesting storage systems and so on, there are ways of, of doing that. So over, once you overflow the kernel stack, you overwrite whatever is beyond it. And just for extra fun, there's a little structure right at the end of the kernel stack called the, the thread info structure, which has a lot of interesting authentication related information and so on. So it's, it's not surprising that, that stack overflows are something that attackers have been interested in for quite a while. With hopefully 4.9, we will see the kernel stack bounded off so that it cannot overflow, or if it does overflow, then, then the kernel knows about it and simply kills the process. The thread info structure is moved out of the way, all that sort of stuff. So as of 4.9, if we're lucky, then kernel stack overflows will no longer be a way that the kernel can be exploited, even though such overflows probably still will exist in the kernel itself. Hardened user copy went into 4.8, a way of checking copies of data between user and kernel space to, to make sure that, that things are not being abused there. Reference count hardening, there are a lot of exploits that depend on overflowing or underflowing a reference counter, usually to try to trigger some sort of user after free vulnerability. So those patches are out there. I don't know when they'll go in. And a whole bunch of other stuff that's happening in this area. So this is all good news. It's worth pointing out that a lot of this stuff comes out of the GR security patch set from years ago. They've had this for a long time and have um, rather snidely been telling us that we should have it too. So we're finally getting some of this stuff. Um, the Linux Foundation has nicely funded some of this work, not all of it, through the, the Core Infrastructure Initiative. So we're finally getting somewhere, which is a good thing. But it's really just to start. And um, there's a catch here that we're going to have to get over, which is that a lot of the security-related code has trade-offs. It has performance problems, or not necessarily problems, but regressions. And we do have users out there who get really upset at a one-half percent performance regression in their particular workload. So a security change with, with a half percent performance hit is, is not at all uncommon. So these things have to be fought for. And there is, there's typically been resistance from various parts of the kernel community to, to taking that sort of a cost for security uh, type of fixes. There can also be user space compatibility issues if behavior changes. Those are less common, but they can, they can happen. So the real question with security stuff is, can we convince the development community that these sorts of security changes are worth the cost? A few years ago, I would have said, no, we simply can't do that. Now, the, the picture has changed a little bit. Again, thanks to the work of Constantine and Case Cook and a whole lot of other people who've been really pushing this agenda hard. So I, th I think that the, the environment has changed a bit. But it's, it's still going to be a struggle to continue to get this stuff into the kernel. But hopefully we'll have a better story with security sometime soon. All right, so we have the kernel. There's all kinds of stuff. But sometimes people want to go all the way around it. And I want to talk about a particular case that of interest here. In your typical model of how a system like Linux works, you've got this monolithic kernel that sits absolutely between the application and storage devices, other hardware, the network, all that sort of stuff. People often want to go around the kernel for various reasons. Persistent memory, for example, is inspiring some people to bypass the kernel to get to, to storage devices because they think they can get better performance that way. Something that you often see is people bypassing the kernel's network stack because they want to get better network performance for their particular workload. You see this a lot in high frequency trading, for example, where they'll use a very special purpose user space network stack. I'm going to talk about network bypass, but in a different context altogether. In the context of a patch set, this is not in the kernel now, called transport over UDP, or TAU, because it, it raises some very interesting questions. 
The idea behind this particular patch set is that you take your transport level protocol, usually TCP, and rather than implementing that in the kernel, you actually embed it within a datagram packet, a UDP packet, and you send that instead. So the only thing the kernel sees is basic UDP, low-level, non-stream-oriented, connectionless traffic, with everything else buried inside of that thing. So that allows you to do your transport protocols in user space, if you wish to do that. This is not the only approach to this. There's another thing out there called Quick, which is actually supported now. And um, the Chrome browser can use Quick, for example. So this is an idea that is, that is out there and in circulation. So why would you want to do something like this when we have a perfectly good TCP implementation in the kernel? And the reason in this case is not performance. The reason is to get faster deployment of changes to the protocols. So let me talk, for example, about the TCP fast open protocol extension. This was implemented in Google five years ago. We've had it in, in the kernel for about five years. It, it reduces the handshake required to set up a TCP connection. So you can set it up faster so you can get your web, your web pages or your images or whatever faster. It, just, it speeds up network accesses and reduces latencies there. But nobody is really using TCP fast open, open, even though sites like Google have it implemented on their servers, because the kernel that is running in your phone or the kernel that's running on your Windows desktop, somebody out there has one, admit it, or your, your, your Mac OS book, whatever, does not yet have this TCP feature in it, even though it's been a standard feature for many years. This is a story that happens over and over again. The, the software that's running in these settings is so old that, that we really cannot extend the, extend the protocols in this way. It's gotten bad enough that, that David Miller, who's the maintainer of the networking stack, who really dislikes the, the TCP over UDP or transport of UDP patches, has said that our TCP stacks are so old that this is the only way to get even moderately recent TCP features. He understands why, even though he doesn't like, to, doesn't like the idea. The other reason is related, which is interference from middle boxes. Middle boxes are all the routers that are between you and whatever you're trying to talk to on the other side of the net. Um, these routers can get in the way, both in terms of protocols, because a lot of them will filter out anything they don't recognize, anything that they don't think is, is a good thing to pass through. So if anybody remembers the, the problems with explicit congestion notification, which went into TCP, 10, 15 years ago, something like that. But if you turned it on, you basically broke the network because all these middle boxes would not let the traffic through once you actually enable ECN. The other problem with middle boxes is they, they spy on you and can either control your traffic or copy, make copies of it or whatever. The interesting thing with TCP or transport of UDP is that you can encrypt the payload in this UDP packet. So what's passing through the network is absolutely invisible to, to everything that's in the middle because it's all encrypted within this UDP packet. So the whole TOU idea brings back this notion of the end-to-end the, the end -end principle on which the network was originally designed, where only the endpoints know about what's in your packets, and everything in the middle, its only job is to pass them through. So it's a nice idea. It can bring about... Um, a net that we can perhaps innovate on again and a net that's more private. So there's some really nice ideas behind this, this whole patch set, but there is a big but here, which is we're talking about shipping protocol improvements in, for example, a transport layer network stack that lives inside your Facebook app or whatever other app that you're running. These enhancements don't necessarily have to be free software. They don't have to be something that's part of an actually established network standard and anything like that. They don't have to be something that's used anywhere else. So I think we, we're running the risk of, of splitting the network apart into a whole bunch of incompatible, inoperable protocol sets that each, each app speaks on its own. And th that is not a world that I think we want to, to move into. So this is why this kind of work is having a hard time getting into the kernel. It's because people are afraid of this world. Because the, the net has or sorry, the, the Linux kernel has for a while now been kind of the reference implementation of, of various network standards that have been established out there. It's been the, the unifying part for us that's, that's held the network together. If we start moving to, to network stacks that are shipped as part of apps and so on, we may move to a world where we've lost that. And we don't really have that unifying force anymore. And that, that would not be good for the net at all. So we have to tread really carefully here. 
but um, I don't know how we can can really avoid this this movement of, of protocols in the user space. I think that that's going to happen to us one way or the other. You know, it's just a matter of how we can manage it. So it's an interesting world that we're heading into. All right, something totally different. Talk about a thing called BPF. I went looking for for a nice picture for BPF, and the, the best that I could find was this, um, which isn't quite what what they had in mind. But you know, you take what you can get. What BPF actually stands for is the, the Berkeley Packet Filter. It's a virtual machine. It's essentially a simple emulated computer that runs within the kernel and allows the, the loading of executable code into the kernel itself with the BPF system call, which we've had for a couple of years now. You can then run this program in kernel space within the kernel. These programs can exchange data between the kernel and, and either kernel space itself or, or user space. You can do all this sort of stuff. So, you think about this, you know, I think this sounds kind of dangerous to allow the loading of code into the kernel to run there. With, with Lock, it's not dangerous because the BPF subsystem has a fairly extensive set of verifier code that actually looks at the code, does a static analysis of it, and simulates its execution, and makes sure that it, it doesn't do any of a number of things that we would rather it didn't do. So, for example, BPF programs cannot loop because we don't want something that's going to go into an infinite loop and tie up the kernel that sort of thing. There's no access to arbitrary memory. There's no leaking of kernel, kernel pointers into user space. That's something that attackers often want, is pointers into the kernel so that they know where things live in the kernel. So there's a fairly extensive set of checks to make sure that the kernel pointers don't get leaked out to user space. Um, there's no access to uninitialized data, so you can't just go fishing for stuff in, in kernel space memory. Uh -huh. You can't load constants into, into a program either. They're actually blinded, they're obfuscated on the way into the program. This is to keep people from loading ROP gadgets into programs and trying to exploit the kernel by way of return-oriented programming tricks, that sort of thing. So a whole lot of stuff has been done. If you, um, if you believe the, the promises in these programs are absolutely safe to run in kernel space. Otherwise, you might be a little bit leery, especially given that, that unprivileged users can load them in, in some situations. But, but the chances are that it's, it's pretty solid at this point. So a lot of work has gone into this. So we've got this mechanism. How is it used? I can't really go through all of them in detail, but there's a lot of uses for BPF in the kernel, starting with the basic filtering of packets to sockets, which was the, the original use case for BPF 20-some years ago when BPF was first created. Various other things... Um, all the way through to the bottom item on the list, which is loading BPF programs into network drivers or actually into network devices themselves to do low-level filtering and forwarding of packets so that you can deal with network packets without ever actually bringing them into the kernel. And that's the sort of thing that people are looking at to do to, to bring up networking performance to where we need it to be. So perhaps the biggest deal, though, is actually the trace point data filtering, the second to last one there, which went in, I believe, in four... Five or four six, four six, I think, somewhere in there. We've had it for just a little while. We've been told for years that Linux lags behind systems like Solaris and that we don't have a nice dynamic tracing system like DTrace. Well, with the ability to load BPF programs and attach them to trace points, we now have that. We have a dynamic programming mechanism that we can put into the kernel, attach the known points in the kernel, have it respond to, to various tracing events, gather the data, <coughs> analyze it in kernel space, and, and make the results available to user space. So we now have that capability that we've been told for years we, we lack. We still lack some of the nice user space features that DTrace might have, but we can get there. People are working on that. So th there hasn't been a lot of fanfare around this, but this is actually a very important de development in terms of our ability to, to trace what's going on with the kernel and watch what's happening in a kernel um, as it runs. So we'll see a lot of other stuff happening as well. Um, over the course of the coming years, I think we're going to see this pop up all over the place. Is anywhere where somebody wants to load a bit of policy code or something like that into the kernel, we've now got a mechanism that makes that pretty easy to do. So in the future, more and more bits of the kernel decision-making apparatus, I think, will actually come from user space and be loaded at runtime. So it's going to be, be interesting to watch. Let me talk a little bit about stable kernels and backports. Um, when I talk about backports, by the way, I'm not talking about that charging port on the bottom of the Apple mouse. 
um, but the, the process of, of porting kernel features back to, to older kernels. If we think back, let's get nostalgic for a bit, for those of us who've been around for a while, to so the days of the 2.4 kernel, or in that, that era, the early 2.x kernel. Those were a time when we went multiple years between releases, from the first 2.4.0 release through the 2.6.0. It was about three years. Uh, it took us to get a kernel release out. So things moved rather more slowly in those days. But we had huge feature gaps to fill back in that, those days. There was still a lot of stuff that wasn't working in Linux the way it needed to be. So there was a lot of code being developed. People were, were cranking out patches left and right. And people wanted to run this code. So, but we had no, no stable kernel that actually contained that code. So what happened was the distributors would, then, would backport a lot of this code into 2.4, earlier 2.2 kernels, to, to make it available to their users, to the distribution. So while they were at it, they also threw in a bunch of out-of-tree code that they seemed useful. I don't know how many people remember things like the Tux web server that, that Red Hat actually shipped inside the kernel once upon a time. Um, there, there were interesting things that happened back in those days. We ended up in a world where some distributors were shipping patch sets that were actually bigger than the kernel was itself, um, which was kind of a mess. Then 2.6 came out and they had to try to forward port all this stuff and keep things going. And it, it was clearly an unsustainable, unworkable situation. So what did we do about that? What we did was we came up with a rule called the upstream first rule, which said that if you can, you get your code into the upstream kernel before you ship it. At a minimum, you at least you develop it against the upstream kernel and aim it that way so that it will get there sometime shortly after you ship it so that we don't have all this weird out of tree stuff that people were shipping before. And along with that, we adopted what was once called the new development model. It's not that new anymore, where we now ship kernels every nine or 10 weeks instead of every two to three years. That allows us to get these changes out to users much more quickly and gets rid of much of the motivation to backport changes, that sort of thing. So it allows people to run, run current kernels on, on their systems and so on. So with that sort of stuff, we, we solved the problem, or um, so we thought. For a while we did, and in some parts of the Linux user community, the problem pretty much is solved, I think. But I pulled out my phone the other day, and I pulled up the, the phone status screen and looked at it. This is an Android 7.0 device, right? It's running Android Nougat, the absolute current version of Android. This is absolute bleeding edge software, the newest stuff you can get. Um, it's running a 3.10.73 kernel, which is um, perhaps a little bit less so. In fact, 3.10 was released in June of 2013, right, with the 3.10.73 update coming out in March of 2015. So even with the updates, it's a year and a half old, that kernel that is in there. But 3.10 as a whole is 221,000 patches behind the mainline. So it's missing a feature or two. Um, so what, what happens then, right, they're shipping 3.10.73, but clearly they're going to want a bunch of the things that have happened since 3.10 was released, some of the stuff that we've done over the course of the last three years. So they backport it. They backport it into this thing, and they create their own sort of Frankenstein kernel that's got all this stuff, plus all their out-of-tree drivers and so on, and they ship that. So... You know, why would you do this when you've got a nice current mainline kernel that has all this stuff? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One of them, of course, is fear of the possibility of new bugs and regressions that come with new mainline kernels. And this is a legitimate fear, right? Again, in a world where you're shipping, when you're adding 76,000 changes over the course of a year, you're going to add an occasional bug or two. Uh, performance regressions do tend to pop in over time as well. They're sort of insidious in the you have a whole bunch of patches that will cause a 0.2% performance regression. And then you have 10 or 20 of those, and you've, you've started to see a real performance hit. You have to track all those down. So this is a real fear. This is a legitimate fear with regard to newer kernels. But it is something that is manageable. In fact, Mel Gorman recently posted a thing about moving forward to current kernels and fixing the performance regressions, which is really his job, is fixing performance regressions. And, and his conclusion that was easier than, than doing all these backports. But the other aspect of this is here. This is a slide that Tim Berg put up at the Kernel Summit last year in 2015, listing various handsets and the, um, the number of, of out-of-tree lines of code that go with it. So if you have a Samsung Galaxy S5, 
right? It's got over 3 million lines of added free code added to it. Um, it's an S5, so hopefully at least it doesn't catch fire. But, um, but with all this out of tree code, you can't be entirely sure of that. Yeah, even the best cases have got over a million lines of, of out of tree code here. It sort of seems like we've gone back to the bad old days of 2.4 in a sense, that we have all this out of tree code being shipped by these various vendors. Yeah, this out of tree code has a lot of problems, but one of them is that if you want to go to a current kernel, you have to then forward port it to that kernel. So all of this out of tree code is serving like a big ball and chain that is holding these vendors back and keeping them from, from moving forward. They look at all of their, their big blob of out of tree gunk and they say, are we really going to forward port this stuff or do we just want to backport a few more drivers and a couple of features because that's what we need? And they say, okay, that's easier. We'll just do that. And so they keep doing that. So, so the out of tree code is a real problem for everybody involved, right? It's, it's really, it's acting as an anchor for, for the people who use it as well as for everybody else. So why do they do this? Well, there are various reasons for having out of tree code, including the fact that simply upstreaming code can take a long time sometimes. Things like the wake clock feature of Android took years to get upstream. That sort of thing. We still don't have a USB charging subsystem in the kernel. As, as Tim Bird talked about, said when he talked about this stuff, you might, if you really work at it, be able to get a mainline kernel to work on a few handsets that are out there, but only for as long as the battery lasts because you won't be able to charge it. So um, this is not a good situation, right? But this stuff is out of tree. We obviously can't tell these, these vendors you can't ship anything until you've gotten it upstream or they would never get anything shipped. So they, they have to go ahead and ship stuff. Some of what they ship is simply not upstreamable. Uh, and there are vendors who have rewritten the scheduler to do sorts of things that they want to see done in the scheduler. Um, let's just say that they haven't really thought about all of the use cases that the kernel has to, to satisfy when they did their own nice little scheduler, that sort of thing. This sort of stuff, I, nobody wants to see it upstream. It has no hope of getting there. And, but the other problem is that the kernel really just moves too slowly for this sort of world where, where products come and go over the course of months, that sort of thing. So in a sense, it seems like we're back to 2.4 again, where the kernel moved too slowly, except the time scale has shifted now. All right. Once upon a time, two to three years was too slowly. Now two months is too slowly for, for what's going on out there. And I don't really know how you fix that because there's only so, so fast you can go, even in our, our world. Uh, there's, there's no way of, of putting this problem. And the kernel developers are saying, we've been doing this for 25 years, 25 years now, and um, we plan to be still doing this 25 years from now. Actually, some of us hope we're not doing it 25 years from now, but we expect somebody will be. Um, and we want to have a kernel that is out there that is still maintainable, that is still workable. In, in those 25 years. So we cannot just take whatever junk code vendors throw over the wall at the kernel, right? We have to have, have code that um, is maintainable over the long term. And so this is simply going to take a while. There's only so fast that we can do this. But we have the, the consumer electronics manufacturers and others saying, nobody's going to even remember our product next year, much less, um, you know, being trying to, to develop on it. So, so we really just, we, we can't be that concerned about what's going on 25 years from now. We don't have these sorts of things. Now, the story, of course, is that their product will be gone, but the next product will have something that looks fairly similar to what they're shipping now. And if they had their code upstream, they would have a much easier life than they do now. So there's a whole lot of effort going into talking to these, these, um, these vendors. I know Greg's doing a lot of this, others as well trying to get them into a more upstream-oriented mode so that we can deal with this, this problem because it's really not sustainable where it sits now. And, and something needs to be done or we're going to start to have some really serious problems. This is, in my mind, the, the, the single biggest process problem that we have at the moment is making the kernel work in, in the very fast consumer electronics embedded systems world and trying to get them to understand how to make things work over the long term. So we'll see. We've solved a lot of other problems over the years. I expect we'll solve this one too, but it's gonna take some work. All right, last thing I wanna talk about briefly 
is the whole idea, issue of, of copyleft and copyrights. And in particular, the problem that there are a whole lot of companies out there, some of the same companies we just talked about, that are shipping the kernel without complying with the terms of the GPL. This is something that's pretty well understood at this point. You go to your basic electronic store and look around and you will find a few examples there. So this is creating a quite a significant amount of frustration in our community. People are getting pretty unhappy. And this has brought out a really important question that we're trying to solve, which is, should we resort to the courts and to legal action to try to resolve this problem or not? So there are people who are out there who will make the point that without the threat of legal action, some of these companies simply will not comply with the GPL. They're just not going to do it, right? Unless there's some, some consequences, they're not going to listen to us. And we've, we've had some good results from legal action in the past, they will say, and if we don't enforce the, the license on the kernel, then what we have is, in effect, is something that is BSD licensed instead of the GPL. And that is not a world that the good chunk of the development community wants to live in. But there is a, another side to this. There is a response, which is that people will say that lawsuits will take a company that may or may not be cooperating with us, but might be, and probably has some Linux advocates within it, and it will turn that company into an enemy. It will, the company will close its doors, will stop talking to us, and shut down. And the people who support Linux internally will become marginalized. And it may set back the process of opening up that company for several years. This is something that we have seen happen in the past. And so it may be counterproductive in a lot of ways. The outcome of legal action is never entirely certain. And we may get rulings out of the courts that make things worse than they were before. Again, you never know. It's a gamble. Um, it will claim that very little useful code has come this way. The, the busy box lawsuits are often held up as an example here, where the lawsuits were won, right? They were victorious in the court, but there was really nothing that came back to busy box as a result of that that was useful. And the companies that were using busy box are now looking at using other things. And the busy box project as a whole has slowed way down at this point. Um, it doesn't look like a world that, that people would like to live in. So this point of view says it's far better to work with the engineers and other people in the company and try to bring about change within the company. Try to make them realize that it's better off to work with the upstream and to, to ship their code and to, to work with our community that way. And they say that we've had great success that way that without using the courts to do so. So I haven't put up a slide like this for a few years now because it's kind of the same old story. But it's worth pointing out. So over the course of the last year, these are the top companies. These are just the top few of a list of about 400 companies that have contributed to the kernel over the course of the last year. If you look at this, you realize that at an absolute maximum, about 13% of the changes that came into the kernel over the last year came from people working on their own time. Everything else came from somebody who was being paid by one of these companies to do this work. Okay, this is where the activity of our kernel comes from. This is where the, the dynamic nature of our kernel comes from. Without, without this... No, that is correct. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, Intel left Red Hat behind about a year ago. Um, no, 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 that is correct. Okay, that, that's the way it has been. Um, for various reasons, I think we're about at peak Intel at the moment, but um, <laughs> but, but, but you never know. Um, <laughs> I'm seeing head shaking in the audience. But, um, anyway, yeah, that, that, that's been that way for a while. So the, the point that people are making is that without this, we would not have the kernel that we, would ha that we have now. We would not be where we are now. We would not have this level of world domination that we have now. So before you start attacking the goose that is laying this many golden eggs, you have to think pretty long and hard. So, so there are real reasons for being very careful about going to court about this sort of thing. So another way that, uh, that you can look at this, sort of a different aspect of this debate, people who are arguing for legal action are often most concerned about getting the code for devices that are out there right now. They want to be able to hack on these devices. They want to be able to support them after the vendor that put them out has stopped supporting them, which is something that happens way too soon, typically. They want to be able to work with, with what we have in our hands right now. 
The, the people who are more leery about this are thinking more in terms of getting support from these companies for years rather than getting the code for the devices that are out there right now. So it's a, a different view of things and um, which, which side is right in any situation, I won't try to say, but, but there are two very interesting and very different and very legitimate points of view but everybody is coming from the same place in the end, which is how do we best ensure the success of Linux and free software? I think we will be um, debating this for quite some time there. And speaking of time, I am pretty much out of mind. So at this point, um, I will say thank you. I don't know if there's time for questions or not. Anybody have a question? I'll gladly throw the pillow mic at you. Uh, hi. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I have a question about the security part and the fact uh, so you're saying that you need to do much more for security and reinvent some parts of the how we treat security. Uh, I'm uh, wondering, because there are many ways to think about security, how far are things, are, is everything on the table? I'm fine thinking of two things that have not been done, or at least not at the big scale for the moment. One of these is there are millions of kinds of static analysis that are not being used, uh, from dependent types to, I don't know, anything, uh, model checking, etc. Uh, and the other question is, uh, there are many languages that propose to replace C by something that could be safer, or at least easier to analyze, and are the both approaches also on the table. All right, with regard to tools and so on, there, there's clearly a lot more that we could be doing. I mean, we've improved a lot with our tools over the course of the last few years, but I think we're just beginning. And this, we'd love to see more done with static analysis tools and that sort of thing than we are doing now. Um, so I'd say we were just beginning on that. With regard to changing languages, I would not expect that any time. Yeah, I figured so, it was a troll. You know, we, we have a base of, you know, on the order of 20 million lines of C code. Uh, C still seems to be the best language for this. You know, you, you hear things about doing this kind of work in Rust or a language like that. And, um, you know, maybe someday somebody will find a way to integrate that sort of stuff into the kernel in a way that will actually pass muster with the developers. But that will not be this year or next year. I think that that's a long-term sort of thing. I think that we will be dealing with a code base that's, that's in C for quite some time yet. Uh, and a variant on the first part of the question on static analysis. Uh, there, so there are two things. It's, one of them is analyzing the code, and one of them is analyzing the change sets. Um, are there things being done on that, or considered on that topic? Um, patches for analyzing change sets and such, um, I, I mean, or tools, I haven't seen ones that deal with change sets themselves so much as dealing with the code itself. But, you know, there's a lot, although, wasn't, Julia, wasn't there something with, that's based on looking at, cha at change sets now for analyzing change sets out of the, out of your group? Um, I, th I thought, that, I thought I saw an announcement for, for analyzing change sets for, for problems, that sort of thing. Yes, so we have a new tool which is like Coxinal. So Coxinal is for searching for patterns in code, and now you can also search for the same kinds of patterns in change sets. Um, and so you could search for things that look bad and so on. And so we're getting there, but I think we're just at the beginning. Anybody else? Long throw. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is more on the first part of your presentation, which is, do you know um, what is the amount of regular contributors? I mean, you have a number of contributors, which is growing. You have a number of newcomers. 
but how much are contributing on a monthly basis, for example? On a monthly basis, I can't really tell you, and that's not necessarily a useful number. We have about 1,600 who contribute to any given kernel release. So 1,600 over the course of about two months is, is probably the best that I can do. Hi, uh, Ivelix Perez. Um, I had a question about uh, the out of tree code, uh, well, in, definitely in the Android uh, ecosystem. Um, we saw that most of the, the problem comes from code uh, from stock uh, vendors. Uh, we saw in the um, of two uh, contributing companies, uh, there, were, there was Samsung, I didn't see uh, Qualcomm. Uh, did someone approach uh, the large vendors, uh, SOC vendors, to talk about, uh, about this with them? Or? Well, well, first of all, it's, it's not just the SOC vendors, right? Because the, you know, the, the, the integration vendors above them also add a bunch of code. But then if the answer is to look behind you, because Greg has been doing a fair amount of that sort of work. them on the, on the top list, Qualcomm hides it. Um, and I've been spending a lot of time sitting down with the Qualcomm people, trying to figure out how to do this better, and working with the Android team. Google's pushing hard, because Google knows it's a problem too. I mean, those numbers are interesting. Um, you only run about 1.6 million lines of kernel code on your laptop. So every one of those additions is larger than the kernel code you run today. All right, at this point, I think I must be out of time, but I'm around for, for the whole thing. So if you have any other questions, you can come and find me anytime. Thank you all very much.